You are about to listen to a discussion on how to actually live out your faith in Christ, living it out loud within our messy and busy lives. The content of this discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, pastoral preaching notes, and the live small group discussions these notes prompted, something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come now, chew on this with us. Have you ever made a statement that you really, really wish you could just take back? I mean, just erase from everybody's memory? How about this wonderful phenomenon of being given a nickname that you don't think you deserve. And then after you think about it, it's like you really don't think you deserve. Well, I want to welcome you to today's podcast on Chew on This. I am Pastor Orlean Hasseltine, along with Pastor Robin Bjornson, our very own Otto Lundy, and Mr. Nelson, along with his assistant. Yes, we have Miss Nikki back there as well. So they don't want to really be on camera, and I think Nikki would really probably melt. But, you know, maybe for another podcast, we'll watch her melt. But I want to welcome you to the studio today. Yes, Mr. Nelson's all in favor of that. I want to welcome you to the studio today as we discuss and go in-depth on our topic that we covered last night at our Wednesday night group here at Maranatha on the Forest Lake campus. That would have been October 29th, 28th, yesterday. Today's the 29th. October 28th, Wednesday night, we covered this topic about who are the apostles and who is Bartholomew and who is Thomas. So we are at this portion in our discussion of this topic that we've been covering for seven weeks. This would have been week seven, and I do believe I actually counted correctly in this series, and this is actually truly the seventh week, okay? <laughs> Sometimes, you know, one, two, three, five, ten. I mean, you know, maybe it's because of the grandkids. I don't know. There seems to be some uh, skipping going on in past topics. So here we are in week seven. And just as a way of reminder for everyone who is joining the podcast, in case you came just to this one and you haven't listened to any of the ones prior, we want to remind everyone on who is an apostle. There is actually a judgment system that was put into place because believe it or not, other people wanted to call themselves an apostle and there had to be some kind of filtering system. So they came up with a three-step filtering system. You had to have witnessed the resurrection of Christ, the resurrected Christ. You had to know him, see him. You had to have that kind of an experience. You also had to have been commissioned by him to spread the gospel into the world. So he had to say, go do this to be selected by him to do that. And you also had to show. I mean, those two weren't enough. I'm kind of thinking those two are amazing. But there was one more. The power of the Holy Spirit had to do miracles through you like the Holy Spirit did through Jesus Christ. So those three qualifiers were put into place. And this is where we get the 12 apostles and 13 if we're going to count Paul. But that's a different conversation for a different podcast. So there are different symbols. We have covered this, and Pastor Robin brought this up the week that she was preaching. She brought the, in a picture as we're looking at this amazing list that we found in a source in the Nelson's New Christian Dictionary. They put together this list of different images that were attached to different apostles to help communicate who they were to the masses. They did not have social media. They didn't have billboards. They didn't have the easy distribution of written literature. So they would use these symbols on their buildings, in their artwork. And it is interesting to note that this goes way back into our Christian history, to the beginning of our Christian history. So bringing what we think these images could be, we're not, we didn't go anywhere and find the one where it all started from. We're just giving everyone an idea that in that day and age, if you've seen an image like this, you would in, a, in the Christian sector make a connection to, oh, that's about the apostle. Thomas, that's about the Apostle Matthew, and make these connections. And the ones for today, we are going to be covering Nathaniel Bartholomew, who is one person, and Thomas. And the image that we have for Nathaniel Bartholomew is this flaying knife. And there's a whole barrage of different knives when I look this up. And I went for ancient Middle Eastern, tried to go back in that. I am not this research guru, but just giving it an idea to help wrap our head around. And so he was beheaded as well as laid alive Ew. and yes Ew. and Ew. so there is probably i'm guessing two instruments of torture and death but the one that he is known for and that was used as an image for him was the filleting knife so i picked an image out of the ancient images that came up and i looking at it and i'm thinking it's probably not quite right but i'm not sure because i've never that that is 
and will always stay out of my topic of, of expertise. But helping us grimace and helping us feel mortified, that's what it's for. To understand this was the commitment that they made. Mm -hmm. When we discuss these dedicated men and the dedicated process that Jesus trained them in to be able to do this, the passion and the love of the Holy Spirit brought them to standing their ground in their belief of, no, this is what Christ said, and it is worth dying because he also died for this. And they were subjected to unbelievable torture and experiences that we need to wrap our thankful hearts around what we have inherited today is so easy. And these images are really helpful. That's why I love, Pastor Robin, that you included it in the week. You didn't just go, okay, don't just say it. Let's show them. Let's give them an actual picture. And then the next one for Thomas, that one didn't have a whole lot of, some of them have a few different ways they thought the individual died, especially as we get down to the bottom part of the list. So with Thomas, they all said that he was uh, lanced through, that he was killed by a lance being thrown through him. So that one is a spear we understand. So it would have been a Middle Eastern lance. And so there's a picture there that would give you an idea of what it would look like. So if you were traveling through the Middle East at this time, coming to these beautiful cities, and you've seen these images, you would immediately know that this is an organization dedicated and uplifting the sacrifice the apostles made so the church, the burgeoning church could grow. So there's another piece of information, who's the apostles, um, how they died and how those images are, are burned into our ancient history. Then there is this other concept that I think we're getting comfortable with it on this podcast and with this crew because we've talked about it every week, this idea of patronage. We don't want any of us to recoil when we go through the stories and we talk about, well, these ones are in charge and this one had to support this. And these, what do you mean these are in charge? You mean there was a pecking order and the disciples? It's like, oh, you bet there was. Yeah. You have to have organizational structure and it was basically their apprenticeship, the way that they, in their society, not just in the group of the apostles, it was their quote unquote college experience where when Jesus called them, they were put in a well, patronage order, which was something that happened in their society. And it was something you looked forward to your children being part of because that is how they learned and that is how they gained skill. And we find in the apostles, there is a lovely chart. And I know that the print is really small, <laughs> but you can access any of this information on the notes that we have our preaching notes and you can get them at realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday nights. And just by way of reminder, yes, you can download our app. There you go, Gareth. You can get it through our app. He is our, he is our beacon for downloading the app, our spokesman. And you would be able to access them there as well. And you can go through the notes and see the chart and actually enlarge it so you can actually read all the names really easily. But looking at that chart, you get the idea that there are three sections of four. So a triad of fours. And we are finishing up the middle section today that the individuals we're talking about operated as the people in between. They supported the, the, the top four, but they also helped train and mentor the bottom four. We don't know why or how Jesus made these selections, but he did. And it was normal in their society because it was part of, these ones have more experience in leadership is what I'm going with. These ones are going to be learning. And these ones on the bottom are just beginning to taste what it means. And they did a very thorough job. They did an excellent job. So this system worked well in that place and in that time. And believe it or not, we do still do it today. It's called president, vice president, <laughs> director, those types of things. So that is how that they organize themselves. So that's just part of all that background information. And yes, I'm putting my papers on the floor. I'm not having a tippy moment. <laughs> Although, you know, you can't have tippy moments, <laughs> especially when you try to <laughs> walk and run at the same time, you know, <laughs> those types of things. Yeah, weevils yes. do wobble. And they do fall down if you have a toddler who goes, Whick! look at that thing fly. I had a couple of those who enjoyed watching things move very fast through. Wait a minute, I'm married to someone who likes that kind of stuff. Hey, can we launch this? Yes, we can. All right, back to our discussion on Bartholomew and Thomas. There are four sections of scripture, four scriptural four sections of scripture that talk about the list of the apostles. And that is in Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6, and Acts 1. All of those are in our notes. They're also on the screen if you are watching this. And those different portions of scripture give us the list of 
the apostles. They put them in their sections of four. They list them all. So Thomas and Bartholomew are listed there. Now, when we get to the Gospel of John, John calls Bartholomew Nathaniel. And there's some blah, 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 about who and what and how and all that. Is it the same person? Is it what? And yes, we do believe that Nathaniel Bartholomew is one person because those types of surnames are very normal in that society. So Nathaniel Bartholomew is the same person. His name means God has given or a gift from God. What a lovely name. And they believe his name is Nathaniel Bar, son of Ptolemy or Ptolemy, which there is one source that thinks there might be some noble birth connected with the Ptolemies of Egypt. That is there a question? Is Bartholomew maybe of noble birth? And if he mm-hmm. is, it would help explain a, <laughs> a really interesting statement he makes before he meets Jesus. And is he, is he, could he be? I don't know, but it was a very interesting fact about Nathaniel Bartholomew. And there isn't a whole lot written about him. So it's like, oh, there isn't a whole lot known about him. So maybe he is the one and only apostle who comes from nobility. Just, uh, hmm. We'll ask him when we meet him in heaven. (laughs) He came from the village of Cana, which is the village that Jesus did his very first miracle. And when Jesus makes the statement to him under the fig tree, which we're going to get to in just a few seconds, keep in mind that was a very popular statement, a common metaphor for rabbinical study. This idea of studying, searching scripture, looking for truth. So under the fig tree was a way of saying, I seen that you were studying your scripture, I see that you were studying our history, that you were studying the Old Testament. And the reason why is because you didn't study in the house. The house was for where things were cooked and cleaned and it was too warm. So they would plant fig trees around the homes to keep the shade and to keep it cool. And that's where they would relax and eat figs and then they would be cool and they would have some quiet and then that they would study. So that statement, when Jesus says it to Nathaniel, they are wondering if that is what he was saying. And it would fit in the context of what the scripture is saying. So when we get there, this is what Jesus is saying to our wonderful Nathaniel Bartholomew. And this call to Philip and Nathaniel happened shortly after Jesus' baptism. So Jesus was baptized. He went and he called Andrew, Peter, James, and John. Yes, I'm counting on my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and then number five, who is apostle number five? Philip. Yeah. And then he called Philip and Philip did a boop boop. As we're seeing, the apostles have this. It appears that all, all the apostles except one, which would be Judas, had a fascination with scriptural truth already. They, their hearts were turned towards who is the Messiah. They were dedicated to knowing more. And so when they met Jesus, boom, 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 things fell into place. And we have a perfect example here today. Our very first scripture where we find Nathaniel Bartholomew is listed in John 1, verses 43 through 51, and I will read those today so we get an idea of this interesting exchange and uh, conversation that Jesus has with him. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to Philip, follow me. So that we had talked about in week six podcast (laughs) when we were introduced to Philip. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip went and found somebody. Philip went... John records he went after Jesus went to find him. Philip went, and he went and found his friend Nathaniel. Philip and Nathaniel and Thomas are together quite a bit, and they are in the same middle sector. And he said to him, hey, hey, Nathaniel, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth son of Joseph, putting him into category, giving some history about him. Moses talked, this is the guy. And that definitely tells us that Philip and Nathaniel had been studying. Philip and Nathaniel had some conversations. And Nathaniel makes this statement, which we'll talk about in depth in just a moment. Uh, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Or did he say it really quietly under his breath? Or it is recorded right here for history to look at and wonder what was Nathaniel saying and Philip loving his friend and knowing his friend what did he say he said come on come on Nathaniel come and see come and see experience it plug in what you know into what is happening now and see what you think Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said 
of him. Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit, or in whom there is no guile. This concept of come and, and meet a true Israelite who is sincere and upright. What? What a welcome, what a banner, what I am making a t-shirt. Jesus said this about me. I'm where no better yet, for our listening audience and our viewing audience. Getting a tattoo. <laughs> Put it in quotes, sign it, Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> there you go. There you go, Nathaniel Bartholomew. You need that tattooed on you. <laughs> Nathaniel said to him, how, um, how, excuse me, sir. I don't know you. How, how do you know me? And Jesus says this to him. Here's the statement. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, when you are over there studying, I saw you. And Nathaniel pauses. He had to write. He had to pause and go, huh. you see, and you're here, and you know, and you, you know those questions you ask that you don't find the end to because your brain is racing so fast in here. Nathaniel had a lot of information already stored up there. So he's able to put that information of what he knew, the Messiah, about who the Messiah was going to be, what scripture had said and prophesied. And he is trying to fit it into this moment. And Nathaniel goes, Rabbi, teacher, you, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Taking all that study and all that information and putting this experience and it fits into this. And Jesus, I know he chuckled. <laughs> because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. You do believe? You will see greater things than these, my friend. And I'm adding in some things because, you know, I'm in the conversation here. Like my friend isn't listed there in scripture, but it really is in Jesus' heart as he's looking at one of his future apostles at this point. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. At which point, Nathaniel Bartholomew was trying to find the scripture references to all of that. He knows what Jesus is talking about and his brain is just speedily going, boom, putting all of these things together. I have to laugh, Pastor Orlean, because, um, you know, you talk about how many times you read the scripture and you see things. Um, but I hadn't ever really registered this before when, he was, when he was talking, talking about, about finding him, finding under, him the under the fig tree. Fig tree. Yes. Because, because it makes, it makes perfect, perfect sense. sense. That used that to be used our to be hide and go seek place. place. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Growing, up. growing up. You know, you, you can, know, hide, you can totally hide totally under, under there, and with the and way, with that, the it way grows, that it grows, you wouldn't you be, able be able to see to really. Because really. they can get they so can big get and so and shady, so shady. You, can, you can, and a bunch and of your friends, friends can hide up underneath the fig tree, have a snack, but, you know, hide and seek. And so Jesus actually saw him, you know, in the spirit. I don't know. It's really interesting to see that now. Yes and, yes, and for all of you who do not know, Pastor Robin, Robin did not grow up in her childhood here in Minnesota. <laughs> so she is not imagining a fig tree. She was actually, she is a Southern girl. So well, she, and, well, and, and he's and like he's Nathaniel, Nathaniel Bartholomew. It's like, it's oh, there's like, something, there's about, something that about that that resonates, that resonates with my heart. With my yeah, go ahead, have two or three names all strung together, together because that's a nice Southern tradition. You know, Billy Bob James Ross. Anyway, Nathaniel Bartholomew. I can hear his mom yelling that. Nathaniel Bartholomew. That's right. That's right. Start for dinner. Yes, it's yes. time for dinner. <laughs> so looking so at looking that, at small, that portion small portion of scripture, of scripture where we get to meet Nathaniel Bartholomew, we get this understanding of who he is and how he fits into the structure of the apostles. We know that him and Philip are really, really good friends. And then there's four facts about Nathaniel that come out in this scripture, this portion of scripture. One is that him and Nathaniel, are, he is really connected. There is a history of study, and not just hanging out and working together, because Nathaniel is part of the Galilee 7 in John 21 when the apostles go back to work. They go back to fishing while they're waiting to see what's going to be happening after Jesus was resurrected and he hadn't ascended yet. So they're in that hang time, you know, which we all love, that wait and see. But just wait a minute. We're getting there. Come on, just stay put. Just have faith. Just And all of the crazy stuff they had been through, it feels comforting to go back to, well, we're going to go catch some fish in the ocean and see, because this we know. We're not quite sure exactly how the future is going to play out. So Nathaniel and Thomas are part of those seven that go back, and this is their territory. This is where they grew up. So Philip and Nathaniel, this one fact about Bartholomew that we know. The second one is that he's a student of the Old Testament. I've already been referring to that. He knew the prophecies. He understood. And it appears, especially these seven had a seeking heart. They wanted to know what scripture meant and they wanted to meet the Messiah. 
and they were very well trained in scripture. They were not scribes nor Pharisees or nor chief priests, not from the tribe of Levi, none of that type of stuff, but they were dedicated to understanding their faith and they were truth seekers. So we know those two things about Nathaniel. And the third thing is we do have a question, and this is where the small group, uh, well, the small large group as we were last night, because according to Gareth, the seats were warm. Yes, <laughs> can you tell? It's been a very, very chilly, chilly uh, end of fall up here in the, the great land of Minnesota. This question when Bartholomew, the very first thing that comes out of his mouth when his friend who is so excited, here comes Philip, Bartholomew, Bartholomew, guess what? We found him who scripture is talking about. He's from Nazareth, Joseph's son, Jesus. That guy is the Messiah. And he doesn't say, well, Philip, as I read the Old Testament, Micah says the Messiah comes out of Bethlehem. He could have said that. He chose not to. He might have said, but Philip, the Messiah is identified with Jerusalem, not Nazareth. He didn't say that either. What he said is, Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Where in the world did that come from? What's going on inside of Bartholomew? So this thought, is he of noble birth? Does he have some of that in his history in the back of his head? Or is there something that happened in his past? He comes from Cana, which is actually not exactly in running for Jerusalem. He is actually, they say, has less reputation than Nazareth. And Nazareth had a reputation of being a bit boisterous and rowdy. Um, you know, this is where we have to send the uh, security forces in, you know, go settle things. Or maybe they just settle things, their, their fine selves. That, that is just trying to put it in today's vernacular. That it, it didn't have an amazing reputation. So we know that Bartholomew could be making a statement about something that may have happened. We don't know. We know it was a rough town. We'll just put it that way. But so was Cana. Mm -hmm. It was a rough town. But Jesus hung out there. These are his people. This is his place. This is the history. The, this whole nation, this is where his people come from. So it didn't phase him one way or the other. But Bartholomew had an interesting, Nathaniel Bartholomew had an interesting relationship with it. He would never have said that. And it is recorded there for us, for us to deal with. For so, a reason, yeah, a specific yeah. reason that may yeah. take us a little while to figure this out or yes. to the end of days here to and it's guesswork yeah and so that is what i wanted us to have this conversation on what are what makes somebody prejudiced what is the definition of being prejudiced can we define it and once we define it do we think nathaniel bartholomew fits this because we've seen the process of finding out being a bit incredulous at it is that the right insertion of that word and it's like, what? What? Philip, I think you're a little nutty. It's like, wait a minute, how can, how can that be? And Philip is like, dude, come and see. <laughs> Just don't, don't use your study to make your decision when the actual person is right here. Because you can, and what's interesting to note is this seed that we see in Nathaniel goes a different direction than a lot of the leaders of society at that time in Israel. And this is where Jesus ended up being crucified because of the same type of seed. So let's look at some of the, yep, we do have it. On our handout, the handy dandy, yes, we take pictures of all the prayer requests on Wednesday night and all of our discussion notes. So high tech right here. <laughs> copy paste. It's I great. can copy paste. It works to super effective. <laughs> <laughs> remind us, even though it was just a few hours ago, it helps us remember. Well, I like how you have those digital writing utensils there. What are they called? Uh, um, like markers. White <laughs> 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 oh, <wow>. markers <laughs> <laughs> that we hygienically clean. And then if you take one and touch it and put it back in the basket with the rest, they all get wiped down with bleach wipes. There we go. So we had this wonderful conversation on what is prejudice. Could we define it? So what are some of the things that the group that was there last night brought up to help define it? Usually it's of a negative 
mm-hmm. opinion. It's uh, true. I don't mm-hmm. know how I you could be yep. make it a positive. I mean, I tried to bring about the Vikings. Right. 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 Yes. But just for the Vikings. Right. Right. Well, then yeah. that means you. Mm-hmm. I, I think we use the word partial today mm-hmm. if we're going to do a positive prejudice because the word prejudice in our society has just grown, and understandably so, grown to be such a negative. So was it the same back in their time using, you know, because we are the one defining it, we are going to be using the word prejudice as a negative connotation. So I think that having that conversation helps us understand that there is, it is, it is negative. What he said wasn't a joke. It was a a knee-jerk response response to his really good friend. friend. I mean, his his friend knew him, and he's like... (laughs) Well, this friend Philip, he he gets gets called by Jesus, Jesus. and instead of hanging around doing anything, what's the first thing he does? does. Runs to his buddy, 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 Nathaniel, there. Yes, come on, come on, come on. And when he balks at him, what does he do? And then it's a, come on, get going. We got this guy, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. What good can come out of Nazareth? And what's so funny, funny to me, to me is, is, okay, so, okay, so Nathaniel, Nathaniel makes, makes all those all statements. Those statements. And, then and then just a few, a few minutes, minutes later, later Jesus, Jesus actually says, says and see somebody, see somebody, that, somebody has that has no has guile. guile. So, so Jesus, Jesus knew, what he, knew said, what he said, but yeah. he's, not, he's attributing not attributing it to whatever, it to whatever guile, guile means in a heart. In a heart. Yes. So, so he can he have this, whatever this is, this prejudice, and still be considered a person with no guile. That fascinates me. Very fascinating. Mm-hmm. I, love I love how complicated and simple it is because it didn't, it didn't affect, affect Jesus one, one bit. bit. Mm-hmm. And if he, and if he seen, seen him playing, playing under the fig tree, studying, studying his little his heart out, he also, he also knew, what he knew what he said. Mm-hmm. It's like, it wasn't, it's like, it wasn't a surprise. It's like, all right. And he knew what and Philip said. said. How, how this is a this huge is a act of love and friendship. This is friendship. He didn't support Nathaniel's statement. He didn't, he didn't correct him, correct per, se. him per se. He's just like, He's just oh, like don't oh, stop don't there. Stop There's it. more. There's come more. on, you have to come, have see, to come truth. see truth. Keep seeking Keep truth, Nathaniel. Keep, Nathaniel. Keep, Keep seeking Keep truth. truth. So that is so one, that, that it was a negative. negative. When we define the word prejudice, we're definitely dealing with a judgment, a negative judgment, per se. When we say that word, we definitely know that's what we're talking about. What else did they bring up? Uh, what else do we have here? Unsubstantiated, because you know, I mean, the very yep. definition is yep. prejudge. Correct. Without yep. knowing the facts. Mm-hmm. Without yes. knowing yes. Yes. Just yes. Not yes. making this up. This is it. Well, you know, you well, say you it like that, Stephen. Like it, it, it just sounds kind of stupid. You are making a statement that is unsubstantiated and without facts. Lovely. Awesome. Definition of ignorance. Ignorance. Yes. Without knowledge. Oh, I gotta <laughs> add that to my list. <laughs> Ignorance. Uh, so very so funny. Very funny. <clears throat> So I'm going with unsubstantiated ignorance. Yeah. I like that. And I think about the stuff, stuff, you know, know, we hold opinions opinions or expectations expectations that are not necessarily necessarily defined defined or crystallized in our head head to to come out our mouth. mouth. And so so here this thing comes comes squirting out of Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Did he know he he had that prejudice? Or was that that just... just Right, 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 right. Huh. huh. Yes. yes. You know? You know? Yes. 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 If by any if chance by any our lovely chance, microphones are picking up, picking up female, female laughter, laughter and chatter, and chatter in, the in the background, that's a good thing because it's happening right outside the door. That means the <laughs> lobby is hot. <laughs> yes, we love that. <laughs> we love that. I, I'm, I'm also, also interesting when we look at, look at what does prejudice stop us from doing? Normally it stops us from seeking truth, but here Nathaniel had a really true friend who just kind of smacked him upside the head and said, hey, I know your spirit, I know your heart. Yeah. I want you to go and I want you to meet, and then, then tell me if you think anything good can come out of Nazareth. So he challenges his unsubstantiated ignorance in relationship, within a relationship, not in this condemning whatever, and he helps him process to truth. What's unfortunate, as we see in the life of Christ, that prejudice usually stops any kind of process. Yeah. You, don't, you don't grow, you don't research, you don't look for truth, you are just bound and determined, I am right. Mm-hmm. And so there's no processing of disagreement. So mm-hmm. if that is true, then was Nathaniel really prejudiced? Or did he just harness this untruth mm-hmm. in his being for whatever reason? Mm-hmm. Something negative happened to him, to him yep. in yeah, Nazareth or something like that because he goes from a rather obviously opinionated fellow here to Nazareth what good, what good, to, what good, to what good, probably 30, 30 seconds. seconds to you are the son of God. Right, right, right. It's like, 
So that has so to that show you that there he was open yes, for open change. change were correct. correct. Well, what Jesus, well, what Jesus uh, prophetically, uh, prophetically stated over him, right, right, the young right, man yeah. with Algaio, yeah. mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. he knew in he his knew heart, his you can't spend can't all that time studying scripture and not have it change. And not have this, and not just studying it, but putting it to applying it to your life. You can study it all you want and it doesn't do anything unless you actually do actions connected with what you just learned. You can say you love people and until you actually serve them, you don't love people. You just like to make the statement. And here, I think our, our lovely Apostle Nathaniel is the example of what the hierarchy in Jerusalem would not do. This idea that they would not process disagreement. No, you're wrong. End of discussion. And in John 1, 11 and in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, those are verses that talk about that the people wouldn't receive Jesus. This little bit that we see in Nathaniel, and I never, you know, like you said, Pastor Robin, all the studying and reading that you do, how many times have I read through the Bible, mm-hmm. this idea that it never occurred to me how much personality each and every one of these had until you pause on the scriptures that we have right. that speak about them and take a... A moment, and I, it never occurred to me that this could have shown up mm-hmm. in the apostles before they were apostles, and even really before they were disciples of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And Jesus is showing this is how it's supposed to go. Now, there's all these other people who started out the same place Nathaniel did, but they just didn't want truth. They didn't seek. They didn't ask questions. They didn't process. They, I know what I know. You are not as smart as me. End of story. You don't have the degrees I have, end of story. You don't have the experience I have, end of story. They didn't even go to have that face-to-face dialogue. They didn't allow questions. They didn't allow group conversation. They didn't trust anyone who was different than them. And so just all of that, especially in today's day and times, the process of how truth is disseminated in your world, there are those who will not because it shakes their foundation and they don't want their foundation shook. Mm -hmm. And then there's those who want truth more than they want the foundation they're standing on. I did not realize Nathaniel would be the poster child for that when we started studying him. One of the things that I see in this too, Pastor O, is, is, um, and I realize realize part of this is my imagination, imagination, but but when when Philip Philip says to him, come and see, see. what I see Philip Philip doing is saying, saying, I need you to trust me. me. Come out out on this limb with me me. And see. And see. So, so Lee, just, trust, just me trust me and come check, and come it, check out. it out. And Nathaniel, and Nathaniel actually, actually does. does. There's, There's something, something about, about their, their relationship, relationship where, he, where will he will suspend his prejudice, his prejudice and, actually and actually step out, step out, on, that out on that limb. And he finds, and he out, finds for out, out for himself. So, so I, yes, love, I that love that trust, that trust of, of, okay, okay well, well, let's go check it out. It sounds like he was the first one to proclaim Jesus as the Son of God. I don't think that happened before that. It's a good statement, good statement, Otto. I'm huh. wondering, because huh. it, so so it, yeah, it, yeah, it was so immediate. And it was, yeah, from prejudice and not believing I was this guy to, you are the son of God. Yes. Talk about, Talk about making, making light, light years worth years of progress, progress in the twinkle of an eye. eye. Yes. I'm like, you know, well, then it definitely has something, well, has something to the compliment that Jesus paid, the prophetic word, that Nathaniel is honest and sincere. He's without guile. He has no craftiness in him. He doesn't practice deceit or cunning. He is not a deceiver, which words we will find have application to a different disciple. But this idea that there isn't any, and Pastor Robin, you brought this up as we were prepping this morning, trying to think of individuals you may know who do not have any deceit or guile. These truly innocent people who they have I don't even know how would we begin to describe a personality like that. I really like that yeah. question. How would we describe an individual who doesn't have craftiness, cunning, deceit, or deception in their being? They just would never think to hoodwink somebody. It just mm-hmm. isn't in them. Mm-hmm. And that's just putting it really positively in a kind of a silly statement. But it's like it's just not in them. And are there? And I think that there's a, a couple people I know, family members, that is like they're just they no, they're not crap. They just wouldn't do that. They will hurt your feelings because Nathaniel made the statement, you know, mm-hmm. rather sharp statement, but it's not coming from a place of deceit. They are honest and sincere people. Mm-hmm. And I would say they have a personality of purity. Mm-hmm. That's what I have. Mm-hmm. Mike and I have had, my husband, Mike and I have had this conversation before about some of our uh, 
nieces, nephews, and, the, and the, their person. We just love our family and talk, you know, oh, we're so proud of this. And that, hey, you know, this one has the sweetness that is attached to them where there isn't. I wonder if that is the personality. Now that you brought that up, I wonder if that is that personality that mm-hmm. Nathaniel had. Mm-hmm. That I would use the term sweetness. Now, I know <laughs> we do not use that from, you know, a person to usually describing a, an adult male's personality. We can use it for an adult female a lot. I write, I'm almost 60 years old. I realize I'm talking from my history, not what is currently defining all these different things in our current culture. But using the, the phrase sweetness doesn't seem to be cross the board applicable mm-hmm. to different personalities. I think well, there's no way they're sweet. I don't think anybody would call Nathaniel sweet. I am using it because mm-hmm. I've used that phrase mm-hmm. in my vernacular to understand certain personalities that just they just are so kind. Mm-hmm. There's a kindness. Maybe that, that is a better, mm-hmm. that the fruit of kindness in their life just permeates. And maybe that is what Jesus seen mm-hmm. here in Nathaniel, that mm-hmm. the fruit of kindness had just grown, that there is none, there is no deception in this guy. Mm-hmm. And maybe contrasting with the ones that, the one that's coming up. Mm-hmm. Is like, <laughs> so I just like that, that idea, there is none of this. So just as a way to summarize Make sure I get to number four. All right, here is, as we close, and we will talk about the end of Nathaniel's life. He had definite small group friendships. Another plug for this idea of planting yourself in a study where you can have conversation and pick apart scripture, learn how to apply it, have people say, hey, wait a minute, I know what you're saying, but I want to challenge you to go learn this and then come back and tell me of what you're thinking is really, really grounded in scripture. You need, we all, every single one of us need to have a Philip Nathaniel small group experience. So one, we know that about Nathaniel. We knew he was a student of the Old Testament. We knew that he made a very biased comment, but it didn't appear to be fermenting in his spirit because we also know the last thing we know is Jesus made this statement, he is a man without deceit or guile, that he is a true Israelite. He's honest and sincere, what God wants in his people. So this is who Nathaniel is. Tradition says that he served as a missionary in India He is linked with Philip and Thomas in history after Jesus' ascension. They believe that he was flayed and beheaded by King Astrigus Astrigus in what is now the country of India, somewhere near Mumbai. So that is what Christian history, extra-biblical literature says about the life of Nathaniel Bartholomew. And there are different different uh, extra biblical sources that talk about him and where he may have popped up after he left uh, being part of the, the crew in Jerusalem. There is another statement that I did not cover because I went by it too fast. In John 2.25, it said that Jesus needed no one to bear witness about a man because he himself knew what was in a man. John 2.25 is what Jesus what is, this, what is in Jesus that allowed him to see who Nathaniel was. He just knew what was in a man. This amazing operation of the Holy Spirit and the gift of discernment. Mm-hmm. We see it in magnified application here in this example of calling Nathaniel into being a disciple. So anything else you want to say about our lovely Nathaniel Bartholomew before we move on to one who appears to be known better, but I honestly do not think we really know who Thomas was. But before we get there. No, it looks like he was the last apostle apostle specifically specifically chosen chosen by Jesus. Jesus. We're going to find out as we continue. Because I don't know. I don't know. I don't don't know the the answer to the great question. It looks like at least the last one that's referenced in the Bible there. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really have always, my whole life, I've had a problem with him choosing Judas. <laughs> you know what's in the guy, but apparently it's... We're going to have an interesting study of the last triad. Yeah. And, and and that, that brings up brings something. Up something. So, <clears throat> so when I was looking, when I was at, looking your at your note, Pastor, Pastor Arlene, Arlene, there's this statement, statement in here, here um, um, that says, that says uh, uh, here again, here again we, see we see that God, God takes pleasure in using the common, common weak, and lowly and things of this of world to confound the wise and the powerful. He even calls people from the most despised despised locations, locations. he can also also take a flawed flawed person person (laughs) who is blinded blinded by prejudice prejudice, and he can change change that person person into someone who can transform transform the world. world. And that just, just how filled with hope, hope. you know, because when I look at Nathaniel, I'm not, 
I, yeah, yeah, prejudice, prejudice but, but I don't see, I him, don't see being him being mean, mean with, it, with it, you know, it, you going, know out, going and, out and, you know, you know hating, hating people as a result. It's, 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 it's not in his heart. heart. Right, yes. right, right, right. Almost like, almost like I've, I've seen people that people they just don't have a filter to. No filter. No filter. I understand. Yeah, well, that, yeah. Have you ever made a statement that you wish you could take back? Yes. 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 Multiple yes. times a day. Yes. Yes. So that encourages my heart. It is delightful to look for what we know. And yes, we do have to use our imagination and wondering. And we are definitely trying to be very, very clear with what scripture says and where we try to figure out different personalities because humanity hasn't changed. I mean, humanity was brilliant from the moment God created them. They had an unbelievable aptitude for creation because our God is his creation. And that resides within us, very intelligent and smart. It really drives me bananas when I see any kind of history documentary where they try to minimalize the intelligence of all of the clans that came before us. It's like, they were ingenious, the things that, I mean, and you're still seeing it today. It's just mm -hmm. phenomenal what the human brain, the aptitude it has. Mm -hmm. Here we're going to move into the next apostle we're going to talk about today, and that is Thomas. There are three different places in scripture that we get an opportunity to view Thomas where most of us only use one. So we want to fill in some of the blanks about who he is. And as we started this podcast, I mentioned Matthew 10, Mark 3, Luke 6, and Acts 1, and John 21. Thomas is in all those lists. He is part of the Galilee 7, so he is with that crew that came from that area. So he is with them, and he is part of who they are as far as their growing up history. We, we believe that they knew each other fairly well. So the very first time we really, really, really see Thomas as an individual is in John 11. And it's interesting to note that the Apostle John, when he wrote his gospel, which was, I think, the last thing that he wrote, that he definitely went and looked and gave more information about some of these uh, apostles that are in the middle, so we would know who they are. So this is specifically, he wanted us to know this about these men that he loved and that he served with. And this is happening at the death of Lazarus. If you were with us when we did the miracles of Jesus and we talked about those on the podcast, this was an amazing, this is the miracle that just sent the world crazy. Now they didn't just want Jesus dead, they wanted Lazarus dead because he's the walking billboard that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah. Can you imagine? You get resurrected by Jesus and people are trying to kill you? Yes. People, <laughs> did you not get the memo? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they got the memo, but no. they had that prejudice they that went along yeah. truth to permeate. Wow. Yes. 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 And so yes. here we have Jesus and the disciples left Judea to go park in a place of safety because the heat was on. They, the, though the rulers of the area were just done with Jesus and they were plotting and scheming and trying to figure a way to get him out of out of their way. They wanted him dead, but you can't just go kill him because then the crowds are going to kill you. So they are plotting and deceiving. They did not have Nathaniel's heart. They were definitely people full of deception, those who were in charge at the time. And they wanted this, this rule breaker who is upsetting all their history and their very foundation of the structure of their civil society is going to crumble if we say he's the Messiah. So the, these were some of the excuses that they used to excuse away their bigotry. And so they were hiding here away from Judea, and they get a message from Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, our two sisters and a brother, and they're part of the inner core of Jesus' life. He loved them. They loved him. They were his support. We are assuming that they are a little bit more on the wealthy side, so they invested their wealth into the ministry of Christ, but also that, that he stayed and lived there. That, I mean, they were really an integral part of of who he was and the ministry he was able to do because of their devotion. So the sisters sent a message that Lazarus is super sick. We really, and they knew, they knew the miracles that he did. And Jesus didn't show up. And the disciples are, what? And, and here in John 11, it lists that Jesus tells them that well, Lazarus is, is really ill or we're going to wait a couple days and then he says well Lazarus is sleeping and the disciples are well he's going to get better Jesus if he's resting that means his body's healing right and Jesus is just like all right let's be blunt um hey guys Lazarus is dead we're going we're going back to Judea and now everybody's like, it's like oh, wait a minute rabbi the Jews are seeking to stone you they want to kill you that is listed in verse eight and you you can't go back there I know that you love them we love them too but 
it's not worth your life. Excuse me. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. It is not worth your life. And here is where we meet Thomas's personality in verse 16. John 11, 16. So Thomas called the twin. So we believe Thomas is a twin because it is used a lot by John for the times that he talks about him. He says to his fellow disciples, let us go. Stop the conversation. Quit whining, guys. Let us go and die with him. And they go. So Thomas makes this statement, a passionate statement, of this is our leader. He's going, we're going. And if we die, we die. Now, does that sound like somebody you would call Doubting Thomas? I mean, Ooh. this is our first interaction with him as an individual making the statement. And they do go. And all... <laughs> the whole world goes upside down because Lazarus is raised from the dead after being in the, the burial chamber in the cave for three days, four days. And so here we go, and this whole thing turns upside down. The next time that we meet Thomas is in John 14. And here is an opportunity where Philip, we discussed in week six podcast Philip's declaration which comes after Thomas as Thomas says something and then later Philip says something in the same conversation and here we get a little bit of a different view now we knew from the last statement that because of his statement about dying where Jesus goes following him and if he dies he dies that life without Christ was not anything Thomas wanted to consider he was devoted to, to Jesus if if I have to die following him I am he is the Messiah he is a committed believer He's willing to go and do whatever Jesus, I mean, his commitment is, you can taste it, it's palatable. You can taste his commitment here in that statement in John 11. And so then we move into John 14, and Jesus is talking and training them for what's going to happen after his death burial. He is helping this inner core of disciples understand you are going to be, so he's having these conversations which are really, really hard to wrap their head around because as far as they understood, the Messiah was going to turn the world upside down then and there. So they're still trying to mesh their expectation with what's actually happening. And I don't care who you are as a human being, expectation and actual happening always takes a messy, messy result. And Thomas is trying to walk that. We know how hard it is when we ever have to walk through something we didn't want to happen. And is this what Christians are supposed to be experiencing? I thought scripture said this, and Jesus says, just walk through and I'll go with you. And I was like, no, wait a minute, I don't want to walk through it. I want you to take care of it. I want it to be done. I don't, want, I don't even want it to happen. And we do that here and now. It wasn't any different back then. Their expectations about what was supposed to be, and then just following Jesus, even though the expectations weren't met. So Thomas is here in that as he has this conversation with Jesus here in John 14. What's interesting, just the statement here, so Thomas called the twin, let yeah. us also go that we may die with him I mean we know the whole story you know the the pinnacle Lazarus being raised but Thomas says this before that happened so he doesn't even hasn't seen this yet and he's willing to follow Jesus mm -hmm. excellent death. point Jesus is his plan a yeah and there's no plan B yes you're it good point Otto yes mm -hmm. so it shows us where his faith was at yeah. mm -hmm. the type of relationship in his study and his understanding of what scripture said and what they are anticipating mm -hmm. in this individual mm -hmm. they call Jesus. Mm -hmm. So here they're having this next conversation and Jesus is telling him, don't let your hearts be troubled in John 14, beginning with verse one. Believe in God, but believe also in me. He's making this connection between him and the Father. In my Father's house are many rooms and if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. So they're all thinking, okay, kingdom, Rooms, castle, rooms, you, know, you know, this. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Okay. Good. Send a bus. There's a bunch of us. Send a chariot. And then he says in verse 4, and you know the way to where I'm going. And this is where, okay, Thomas, practical, pragmatic man, I'm guessing, because he's like, okay, Lord, um, we don't know where you're going. You have not given us a map. You say these crazy things, and then you say some amazing things. We know you're the Messiah. I know you're the Messiah, but we don't know where you're going. How can we know? How in the world can we know because you haven't showed us the map? I need tangible. I need to. I'm already sold out 100%, but could you just give me, put, 
you know, download a Google app in my phone, please, <laughs> so I know the way. And Jesus, in my imagination, walks up to him or moves over to him, stands up and goes, because I'm assuming this conversation is taking place while they're seated and they're relaxing. Thomas, you've already found it. It's here. Mm -hmm. You're looking at it. You're looking at mm -hmm. it. You have found it. I am, I am the destination. And Jesus says it this way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Thomas, I'm sure, is sitting there. Okay. If you had known me. Thomas, if you had known me. Oh, hard statement. You would have known my Father also. But from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So he says that, now, if you were really paying attention, Thomas, you would have known what I was talking about. But from now on, you're going to. Mm -hmm. What an endorsement. Mm -hmm. This is just as big as an of endorsement. Mm -hmm. And in that man, there is no guile. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, and now you have seen him. Because after this, Philip goes, well, Lord, just show us the Father. That's enough for us. And then, <laughs> oh, Philip, <laughs> Philip, would you, you just again. be quiet? You're taking over. Yeah. <laughs> so there is this beautiful interaction with Thomas that he is uncertain. He is confused. He's feeling a bit ignorant, very practical, very pragmatic trying to figure what that means, to being a person of faith and having that personality. And he wants to know. Mm -hmm. He risks, so he asks Jesus, I just can't make my natural experience match with your supernatural discussion. Faith is an amazing growth experience. And in this moment, we see Thomas has grown. I love this discussion. It reminds, it reminds me, so, me much. so much. Um, um, you know, after you know, you're after done you're ministry, done ministry uh, I've, uh, had I've had the privilege, had the privilege of working with Pastor, Pastor Orlean for a whole lot of years now. We're going great together. We are going great together. together. And, and um, excuse me, um, we have gone great together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the deal for sure. We are engaged, engaged in the shoot. In the shoot. Um, um, I can remember in the very beginning and for quite some time after that, you know, we would be in ministry circumstances together. And when it was all done, I'd have a few minutes alone with you and go, I don't, I don't, I don't get I don't that. Get Can that. you help Can me you understand, understand that? that? And this, and is, what this is what this says, says to my heart. To my heart. It's, like it's like Thomas is going, going I, I, don't I don't get that. Get Can that. you explain <laughs> what just <laughs> happened there? I, I, I mean, just I mean, this whole just obtuse, obtuse moment of, moment of yes. I don't get it. Yes. Yes. But I love, but I love that, he that he can ask. You know, he feels you know, he safe feels enough safe with Jesus to be transparent, to be transparent with, with a gap, gap in his education, in his education. Mm -hmm. and, and puts it all, puts right, it all out right out there. there. I, don't I don't get this. Get this. Oh, oh, oh. I don't think any of the other ones did either. Right, right. He, right. Says, he, he says, says we, we, we do, do not, not know. know. Awesome. awesome. Well, you're well, spoken spoke now for the ignorance of the group. Right, right. Exactly. And, you know, so there's this wonderful moment in John 14 where, you know, Thomas is being transparent. I don't get it. We don't get it. And then Jesus has these very clear things to say. And with an endorsement at the end. And even after that endorsement, Philip is over here going, I don't, I don't know. I'm supposed to see the Father in all of this. I don't get it. And then Jesus, and then Jesus goes, on goes on to unpack, unpack that. that. And so, and so what, a what a wonderful, wonderful team, team moment, moment for these, for these guys. guys. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and looking and at the looking dynamic of growth, because here Jesus is physically with them and all of these kind, and they're trying to wrap their head around. And the next statement, the next experience, the next stage of Thomas's growth is in John 20. This is after his death, burial, and resurrection. But the resurrection still has not, still hasn't, doesn't have a, a, a boundary, a, any kind of form for them to realize, well, what does that mean? This, I mean, it all happens, so boom, 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 quick. Everything is upside down. This is not how we expected. Jesus is supposed to be sitting on a throne in some palace here in this area, overcoming the Romans, and we're supposed to enact and have, and God loves us, and he's our father, but Jesus is the representation of the father. No, the father's in him, so we can taste the father in you. Wait a minute. All of this is just rolling around in his head, and then we encounter in John 20, where this is where we all meet and know Thomas from, is in this process here, and it's an amazing exercise, if you will. It's amazing, transparent moment once again in the small group of the apostles, how they are just who they are, not afraid to talk and to say things. They're not going to be castigated for questioning or whatever. They're all going to grow and work together. And we see this here. Now, Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin in John 20, 24 through 29, was not with them the first time Jesus in resurrected form walked in a locked room. All right. 
You're in a locked room because you know people are out looking for you and you're not exactly sure just how upside down society is, but you are their target. They don't want you around because you represent this individual who's turned society upside down. And so they're trying to stay safe and keep their people, people safe. And here comes the resurrected Christ walking in the room. So Thomas was not there at that time. Why not? What was he doing? This we do not know. But he wasn't there. So when the others came to him, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the resurrected Lord. He's like, hey, wait a minute. I am not doing that again, mm -hmm. all right? Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails in his hands, and place my finger into, the, into those marks and place my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe. Mm -hmm. I, need, I need to know. If this is the route he took, that death, that all of that I've invested in him, he is the Messiah. I don't get what's happened. And I'm not going to move from this place of acceptance that he is the Messiah. I am here, and I'm not going here until I have tangible evidence. Mm -hmm. So is this doubt? That was a question that came up. What would you say? Is that doubt? Is there doubt in there? Would you call it, that doubt? Or was it a yearning? Was it a yearning? Yes. yes. These other guys saw him, but I didn't. And was he saying this knowing that Jesus is listening to everything you said? Coming out of your mouth there? That, 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 that. Mm -hmm. Jesus, come on, please, please, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't take, take it as take doubt, doubt anymore than, than, I mean, I mean we say, say, oh, there's, there's doubting Peter, Peter there's doubting John. John. Did they, Did they doubt when the ladies came about the tomb? <laughs> yes, no, that's right. 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 Oh, I need to touch and see. Yes. Very good point. Yes. 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 Yeah, and I don't see doubt in this. For me, it's a man who, I can't afford to go there. Oh, this, like this absolutely positively, positively has, has to be, to be real, real because the because whole, whole rest, rest of my of life and life eternity, eternity is banking, is banking on, it. on it. If this if isn't this real, isn't I can't afford can't to let myself get up hope again. Hope again. It, has it has to be, has concrete. To be concrete. And so, and so I wonder, I wonder but that, but that um, um, you know, you know, and I, I and get I, that I this get is that a part of my imagination, my imagination but, but, you know, again, again as we've as said, we've human said, nature doesn't change. doesn't change. And how, and how often, often do we want do we to self-comfort self -comfort by knowing by facts? Knowing facts. Yes. You know, is, you know this, is this, is this is him, him wanting, wanting, you know, an, you know until, until I, I know this, this I'm not going to have gonna hope again. Because I can't I have, can't my, have hope my hope crushed. crushed. Well, I saw him okay. die. He died. Right. He's right. dead. Exactly. 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 So, so is this is Thomas, Thomas having, having um, just exhibiting self-comforting self behavior, behavior, trying to get, trying facts, get facts, facts that he can, that he stand, can stand on? on. My, foundation my foundation absolutely, absolutely has, has to be firm. To be firm. I, can't I can't tolerate my, my mental health, my spirit, my future, my hope. I can't tolerate unstable foundation. I wonder. I wonder. It's a good wonder. Yes, Mr. Nelson. How do we, how do we know, that know that Thomas wasn't just a weird, weird gentleman, gentleman that just wanted, wanted to have such a whole, like, whole, like right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 Did this really happen? Right. right. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. My, that's my. Mm -hmm. side, side. Well, I need to. I need to mesh my expectations with what has happened now. Right. If you want me to believe, I need to mesh these two. And one of the ways, because right, this is who he is. Mm -hmm. This is a way my mesh will happen. Mm -hmm. You're saying all this, all good and fine. So, so this is. The fun part. Yes. So he makes this statement, and then <clears throat> one day. Two days, three days, four days, five days. They're done gossiping about Thomas's statement now because it's been five days. And, you know, there's a grapevine in every organization. And they're just talking about, you know, what was Thomas thinking? Why did he say that? But I get it. I, you know, so they're having that. I understand those sentiments. I'm thinking those as well. Good thing he's got the guts to say them because it, but he never said, but it was really Jesus. Yep, that was Jesus that we've seen. So they're on five days, then six days, oh, then seven days. And then, and then all of a sudden the eighth day. And the disciples are again inside this locked room. And this time, Thomas is there, all right? And the doors are locked. It says right there in John 20, 26, they're locked. And Jesus came and stood amongst them. And scripture says, he says, peace be with you. And I think he stood there. Ta-da. <laughs> you know, in his head, ta-da. And they're all, and once they recognize he's there, he greets them, and he goes up to Thomas. He is doing this specifically because he loves this man. Mm -hmm. Thomas, I, at which time I know Thomas started to cry. Mm. 
And I think he probably fell to his knees because Jesus comes up and says, go ahead, touch, go ahead and go, go ahead. It's true. Mm -hmm. Thomas, it's true. And how he understands his apostles' personalities, how Jesus understands who we, who we are in that scripture verse, which I just threw all my papers on the floor, <laughs> where it said Jesus knew what was in a man. Here in John 2, 25, he himself knew what was in a man. It's happening again. What he said prophetically over Nathaniel, he is putting into actual motion here with Thomas. It's, I know you, Thomas. And Thomas, in my imagination, is on his knees worshiping and probably grabbed a hold of his feet or just grabbed a hold of him. And he says, my Lord and my God, my Messiah, it is everything you told. It's, it's true. It doesn't look how I thought, but, but it's true. It's you. And I think he laid there and he sobbed. Mm. And he sobbed. That's just me and my, how I would be if I was, you know, it's like, and he worshiped mm -hmm. and he worshiped him. So we, we see his skepticism, we understand it. We see that through all the, all the apostles, we, we understand. We had a conversation last, last night about whether or not Thomas was in, in a grieving process. I personally think all of them were because there's loss. Whenever there's loss, we go through those five stages of grief. And not everybody thought that he, he could have been because I might as well list them because we did talk about them um, denial, which leads to isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. This process goes in and out, and, and you revisit it until you have made peace with your grief, however your personality does. And Jesus specifically seen what Thomas was doing, just like he understood Nathaniel, because he knows what's in a man. He knows what's inside of us, and he is going to help our faith grow. And he shows, and he does exactly what Thomas said, because Thomas needed to have this put to rest before he was going to be able to do the rest of the ministry that God had anointed him for. Mm -hmm. Pastor Oh, I wonder too, for me, for me I, see, I Jesus see Jesus in this, in this moment, moment with Thomas, Thomas validating, validating the trauma, the trauma that, he's that he's been through. Been through. Yes, good point. Good point. I see I that, see the, yes, what, what you, you just, just witnessed, witnessed with my body, with my body and, what and what they did, they to, did me, to me, it was a, it was a, a, traumatic, a traumatic experience. experience. I, mean, I mean, you know, you, you talk know, about, I wonder if this group dealt with post-traumatic stuff. Because of, of this, the this heinousness, heinousness of what it is, what they, it is witness. they witness. And so here they are all together, and Jesus is validating him, him and being and with and him being in, with that, in that, moment. that moment. And he doesn't, and he erase, doesn't erase the evidence, the evidence of, it, of it, but because, but because he's, there he's there and connected, and connected with, Thomas, with Thomas, he is, he is an, expression an expression of hope. Of hope. Your, life Your life doesn't, doesn't have to be defined by the misunderstanding, not understanding what I was doing, or even that trauma of the moment. I am hope, and there is hope. Yes. And you see the tenderness and kindness, kindness of Jesus. He doesn't come in there, come on, you knucklehead. I'm not there. You can see. He's just this nice guy. Right. Right. Here I am, Thomas. Yeah. And Thomas was crushed. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. Sweet. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And we know that Thomas did go with Philip and Bartholomew, that he also was in Persia and he was in India. And they believe India is where he was martyred. So whatever ministry that group was doing there, it cost them their lives. So his questions were answered. His questions were answered because of Jesus' love for him, very specific to his personality. This is what you need, so here I am, helping your faith grow. That character that is in our Heavenly Father, that character that is in, in our Jesus is still there. He is not going to come and show us his physical flesh like he did then, but he is going to send us what we need to help us walk in faith because we are going to have the same walk. We are going to have the same, these things don't make sense. And here, as we close today's podcast, I want to ask us, am I so comfortable with my natural process of learning, my natural process of understanding, that it will get in the way of my faith? Am I, am I so comfortable with the way I reason things out that I need to understand it like this? Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to take a step of faith. And my encouragement for all of us is am I willing to risk like Nathaniel and Thomas and step out in faith and allow Jesus to lead me through the things that don't make sense? Thank you for joining us for this week's discussion on Who Are the Apostles? Today, speaking of Bartholomew and Thomas. To enjoy this process live, come join us and the Wednesday Night Crew every Wednesday evening at 6.30 
at Maranatha's Forest Lake Campus. This is Steve Lundy reminding you to always be kind.